Uh, hello everyone, um, I'm George from Ireland. So this is going to be a, a um, law lecture about the European Convention on Human Rights, um, particularly Article 8, which uh, concerns the right to respect for private and family life. Um, all right, so um, the, the, the rights here in Article 8.1 in particular, and we're gonna look at the, the scope of these rights and consider um, uh, what qualifications there are on the rights to family life and the right to privacy, and when an interference with the said right can be permissible. It's considered legitimate on, on, on under certain grounds under Article 8, uh, Section 2. Things that are reported in the press about a person's private life, about family life, and that can be acceptable in some cases. Uh, for example, Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, about 10 years ago, a child of his was born. He was married at the time. This child was born to his mistress, and Boris Johnson sought an injunction to, to hush that up. But the uh, invoking his rights under the European Convention of Human Rights, rights um, uh, Article 8, but the court um, threw it out. He lost his uh, civil case on, on the basis that um, the birth of a child is, is a uh, matter of public record. It's a fact that we, we can see anyone's birth certificate. It's not a state secret. You are allowed to report the birth of a child. Now, he had this child with uh, with his paramour. Why did he want to hush it up? He was very happy to tell the public about his other children, presumably because uh, this child was the progeny of an extramarital affair. He found that embarrassing. He thought it might have, de have a deleterious effect on his political career. But the, the, the um, judge ruling that just because you find this inconvenient does not mean that um, the, the pr press's freedom is going to be taken away. No, they're not going to be muzzled. You're a journalist yourself, Boris. OK, so um, everyone has the right to respect for family and private life, so says the article. And uh, Section 3 goes on to say about the, the sanctity of the home. Obviously, that's not absolute. And a need to privacy for your correspondence. As in my letter, when this was written in 1950, by telephone, by email in more recent times, by text message, and so forth. Um, but uh, again, that's not absolute. There, there are certain circumstances under which the state would have the right to access these things. You remember, the, remember that hacking scandal hacked off about 10 years ago, and people, even some people went to jail for hacking into other people's correspondence. So what is the nature of these rights? Um, as people said, um, there's a case R. Wright, as in W-R-I-G-H-T, the surname, R. Wright and Secretary of State for Health in 2003, when a judge called Stanley um, Burnton had to decide this, and he said, this is the least defined and most unruly of all convention rights. So I have to have to delve into it is developed a little bit since that case. So uh, you have the right to respect for your private life. Uh, there can't be these unwarranted uh, um, trespasses into, into your privacy. Um, so there was a case about this um, called Ore Judas and R.B. Kensington, 2003, and that was decided by Lord Justice Arden. And he had the following to say, at a very general level, um, this covers all aspects of a person's physical identity and thus freedom to live as he or she chooses. To be straight, to be gay, to be asexual, to wear what you want, um, uh, within reason even to wear nothing in a naturist colony, um, things like that. To eat what you want and uh, stuff like that, to drink what you want. There are limits to this about certain illegal drugs. Um, but the physical, moral and psychological integrity to be a uh, polyandry or something like that that's acceptable okay there was x and y against nl costello roberts in the united kingdom 1993 and pretty in the united kingdom 2002 there were some sadomasochists for example engaging in their activities and that was held to be illegal because they'd harmed each other um and uh but, but if it's really harmful to you, can you actually consent it to it? Is that consent vitiated by the fact that it's harmful? Uh, that was a, a, a case that had to be considered in 1993. Uh, Pretty and the United Kingdom 2002 was Diane Pretty, this terminally ill woman seeking to end her life because she was in agony and her condition was not going to was not going to get better. Do you have the right to die? There's a play about it. Um, whose whose life is it anyway? Uh, 1980s play about someone being kept alive. Remember, it's um, uh, the so-called 11th commandment. Who was the poet who wrote it? Arthur Hugh Clough. Thou shalt not uh, strive to keep alive officious officiously, doing everything you can to more or less inflate a corpse 
as they say, if someone's in a permanent vegetative state. So that's that's an aspect of the right to, to, to privacy, to physical integrity, the right to live an unhealthy lifestyle if you want to. Now, you could argue that's been infringed with, say, um, so many no smoking zones, raising the smoking age from 16 to 21, plain packaging, um, infringing upon our right to freedom of expression, to advertise lawful goods. Um, so let's look at your uh, the, the issues of physical and social identity. How about gender reassignment? Someone is, is a born a boy, but he feels himself to be female, wishes to become female, not just calling himself female or dressing in a female way. Could he have his, his, his um, uh, regenerative organs um, reworked? Well, uh, well, you can have that done. Sexual orientation, well, since 1967 in England and Wales, uh, homosexual acts between uh, adults have been permitted. But back then it was defined as, as, as 21. Now it's down to 16, although adulthood isn't actually till 18. Um, and Northern Ireland and Scotland eventually followed suit. There was Bellinger and Bellinger in 2003, a case about this. Or Dutch in the United Kingdom, 1982. Smith uh, and Grady against the United Kingdom in 2000. ADT in the United Kingdom in 2002. Um, you could also look at Lasky and the United Kingdom 1997. So there was, in Northern Ireland, remember it was still illegal in the early 80s, um, and a case went all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. So there were some openly gay men in Belfast. In, in, in the 70s in Belfast, there was not much of a nightlife because the troubles were on so many bombs going off, and in the city centre at night, and there were no, nothing but um, uh, old soldiers and gay men. And so the few pubs we opened were gay pubs. It was kind of, kind of, kind of safe for gays to go out because there was a lot of anti-gay prejudice because you wouldn't be seen because almost nobody was in the streets because of the troubles. And there were, these soldiers were going in their full battle gear into the pubs, as in to see are there loyalist terrorists or Republican terrorists here getting these teenage girls again? They're bum pinched by older gay men, <laughs> and the Royal Ulster Constabulary, that's the police in Northern Ireland, often arresting um, the local gays. Because, of course, until 1982, homosexual activity was unlawful in Northern Ireland. But uh, then, the, then the law was changed um, because, remember, the Offences Against the Person Act applied to the entire United Kingdom. Um, anyway, the, the law was um, amended at, at um, that time. The Reverend Ian Paisley, who was the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, he led a campaign to save Ulster from sodomy. But uh, it was unavailing. Anyhow... We'll look on to issues of personal identity, or indeed paternity. It was R. Rose and Secretary of State for the Health in 2002. So there's genetic identity. Can your DNA samples and profiles be retained against your will? Generally speaking, they can't. Or the Alder Hayes scandal in this hospital where um, some uh, children died and some of their uh, biological material was kept without the say-so of their parents. So it would need to be informed, written consent. It was S and Marper against the United Kingdom 2008. Um, so sometimes uh, uh, the, the father of baby, the name is not disclosed on a birth certificate. Um, is that right? The mother may choose not to, to, to say it, even if she knows. The mother might not actually know, might not even know the name of the man. Or perhaps there are two or more suspects for the paternity. So is that depriving the child of the right to know? Is that depriving the father of his rights? Because if his name is on that birth certificate, he gets rights over that child. Um, so that's another bone of contention. But at the moment, no, she doesn't have to say the name, even if she's certain who it is. Um, all right. So let's look at data retention, how um, some of this information is, is held sometimes against the will of the person whose data it is. There was R on the application of T and others against the chief constable of Greater Manchester 2003, where the police in Manchester were keeping people's information without their say so. Or R. Cat and Commission of the Metropolitan Police 2004, or indeed R. H. and A. City Council 2001, all very anonymized. If you're arrested, uh, they can take um, obviously your fingerprints, your DNA sample, their intimate and non intimate samples, intim non intimates from your mouth. Um, intimate, it could be from, uh, well, a blood sample from your, from your genitals or indeed from your rectum. And um, you need permission for, 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 the, for the latter. Um, not just for the anus, but for the, anything apart from the mouth, the intimate samples. So we'll look at private information and image. 
Okay, there was image von Hanover um, and the United Kingdom 2004 about taking permissions, taking photos without someone's permission. Now, generally speaking, you can take someone's photo in a public place without their permission. Take a photo in the street, thousands of people there. I don't have to get permission for all of them, especially a public figure out in, in public. But what if they're in a private place where, pre, where privacy could be reasonably expected? In which case, usually that's not allowed. Take the French case about um, Her Royal Highness Princess Kate Middleton when she was sunbathing topless in France. And it was a private estate well back from the road with a high hedge. And she thought no one could see her. But a telephoto lens snapped her. And so she won a payout from a French court for, because her right to privacy had been violated. Whereas had she done that at a public beach, the newspaper would have been completely within its rights to publish that photo against her wishes. There was Campbell and MGN 2004. There's a, sometimes there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. Or well, there was Anna Ford, a newscaster. She was on a beach with her boyfriend and some magazine took photos of her and published it. And she took out a case against them. She lost because you're in a public place. You are a public figure. We can we can publish photos of you. Tough. OK, how about searches of the person? Physical searches, patting you down, strip searches even. Depends on the context. You wouldn't do it on the street. There's Wainwright in the United Kingdom, 2006, about searches going into a prison. There's also stop and per search. Uh, the so-called sus laws. The black community of the United Kingdom said these were disproportionately used against them, or still are, but very much so in the 80s. And there was R. Gillen and Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, 2006, Oren Gillen and Quinton against the United Kingdom in 2010. So they'll have to help fill out this form now saying the reason for their stop and search. And they can't do it because of your ethnicity or your appearance of the clothes you're wearing. Oh, look, he's got a beard. Oh, you see that hairstyle, skin, head. They're always trouble. We'll stop them. Oh, look, he's wearing combats. They're bad news. We'll stop them. He's got tattoos. Oh, they're, they're, they seem shifty to me. We're going to stop them. Oh, a young person. They're always suspicious. You can't do it on the basis of appearance like that. It's meant to be intelligence led. Um, so there was Khan of the United Kingdom, um, 2001, or indeed uh, about state surveillance. Or another one, R. Wood and Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, 2009, about CCTV cameras. And the United Kingdom has got the highest per capita number of CCTV cameras in the world. Uh, my statistics might be a little bit out of date because China's obviously got face recognition technology, using it to um, uh, oppress and criminalize the Uyghurs in their racist uh, campaign to deprive them of liberty and lock them all up in, in uh, camps for their brainwashing. There was Peck in the United Kingdom 2003. So being watched all the time. Is this right? Is this an invasion of privacy? Does it take away our rights? It keeps us safe, we're told. Does it? Anyway, the UK still got relatively high crime, a um, higher crime than in those most Western countries. Well, let's examine this right to family life. And that, that means close family relationships, as was decided in Singh and Echo, uh, New Delhi 2004. Uh, so, family life, obviously, your spouse or indeed girlfriend, boyfriend, especially if, it's, if it was a cohabiting relationship, Parents with children, grandparents, grandchildren, um, siblings, first cousins, second cousins, possibly further out. Um, their parents and children, um, RH and RG. This is an adoption uh, disclosure case, 2001. Um, do you have to tell children they're adopted? Things like that. Is there a right to become a parent in Evans in the United Kingdom, 2007? It's decided that there wasn't. Or well, there's a famous blood case. There's a woman die in blood. Um, she and her boyfriend, they wanted to have a baby. He gave a sperm for some IVF thing, uh, the, the eggs, but then um, her boyfriend died. Could she have the eggs anyway? No, she couldn't. It was decided. This is about 1996. This isn't, if you can't have children, tough. Can you get IVF, in vitro fertilization paid for in the NHS? Is a postcode lottery? Some postcodes, yes. Some postcodes, no. But that's not a legal right. If you, if you can't have children the natural, natural way and you really want them, well, that's unfortunate for you, but you do not have the legal right to do that. The state does not have to fund this. You could try and fund it privately. Even then, it's a little bit controversial, creating embryos, many of which will be discarded. You don't even try to make this a baby who gets to be born. So we're looking to respect for your home. The old adage in Englishman's home is this castle. Well, it applies to the United Kingdom in general. And so there was a case about this. It was um, Harrow London Borough Council and Kazi 2003. So Lord Millet had to decide this, and he said the following. It's an important aspect of dignity as a human being, and it's protected as such and not as an item of property. 
close quote. He's talking about the home, okay, that the authorities not coming barging in there unless there's an overriding good reason. Um, the physical details of the home, um, these are matter of law, McKennett and Ash, 2006. Uh, how much can people know about your house? Well, they can actually know quite a lot. You can often go to the blueprints of the public library, Margaret Thatcher's house. Um, people could find out the layout of her house on Chester Square in Chelsea, London, um, which is a little bit dangerous because we might want to assassinate her and make it a little bit easier to know where to shoot or where to plant the bomb or if you're going to break in where you might find her. Um, it also applies to care homes. It's not not just a family home in our Cochrane and uh, again North and, and Eastern Devon Health Authority, two thousand and two. Okay, so um, how about your uh, right to correspondence? Well, written and uh, telephonic communications are covered by correspondence. There were cases. Oh, oh this issue such as R and Fo uh, Foxley in the United Kingdom, two thousand. A Malone in the United Kingdom in 1985. Or indeed, prisoners' correspondence are against Secretary of State for the Home Department, ex parte daily, 2001, because prisoners' correspondence was read to see they're not ordering an assassination or requesting drugs or something like that, or trying to run their criminal empire. Um, they're not allowed mobile phones in prison, but they quite often have them because corrupt prison officers smuggle them in. Or there was a Prince of Wales against Association Newspapers 2006, his Black Spider diaries, writing these diaries in 1997, the handover to, of, of Hong Kong to China, recording the Chinese leadership appalling old waxworks, and the press got a hold of those and wanted to publish his private correspondence. He was irate about it, but the press was allowed to publish it. Or um, uh, when the Prince of Wales was writing to government ministers, lobbying them to do this and to refrain from doing that and to promote homeopathic care and saying that, Fox hunters were treated worse than any ethnic minority and blah, blah, blah. But we did get to see all that, despite strenuous efforts by Clarence House to prevent that coming into the public domain. It's a, he wrote them as a matter of public record, so we did get to see his private correspondence. Um, was that a breach of his privacy? What do you think? Does it make a difference that he's the public figure of the Prince of Wales? Probably. If it led to a friend, that might have been a little bit different. But if I send a letter to you, that's yours, the copyright to sell. I may desperately want you to not to publish it, but you are allowed to publish it. This is a bit of an issue with um, uh, Meghan Markle, Prince Harry, and letters to, to her father and so on, or Princess Diana's letters to um, her, her lover, um, James Hewitt, and he wants to sell those, publish those, and the copyright belongs to him, not Princess Diana when she was alive, and not to her, her estate since, despite her sons desperately wanting their family name, name not to be dragged through the mire, more whether he's been published. Well, maybe her mother, their mother shouldn't have written that stuff. OK, so let's look at an outline of the methodology here. Stage one in Article 8, it's engaged. We have to see if there has been, on the face of it, an interference with this right to family life or to, to privacy of home or correspondence, things like that. Then the second step is to ask either was there a justification for the interference. There was some private correspondence, stage one, and it was published by a third party. OK, so prima facie and interference. But stage two, was there a justification for that interference? Was that a reasonable interference? Oh, yes, it's allowed, therefore. So then we have, we have to look to Article to Article 8, Section 2. So, um, so let's consider whether interference in some of these instances was permissible. So uh, justification, to say that it is it acceptable, interference requires all three of the following factors to be satisfied. First of all, that the interference was in accordance with law. Secondly, that it was in pursuit of a legitimate aim. And lastly, that it was necessary in a de democratic society. Because the European Convention of Human Rights, um, as interpreted certainly by the European Union, is all about democratic society. More broadly, in countries which are signatories of the ECHR, this would seem to be risible because of a very undemocratic light like Belarus or Russia or Turkey. So let's look at this part about in accordance with the law. There is the so-called Sunday Times test. We have to look at the legal basis for doing it. Is it accessible? Was it um, clear, as in framed with uh, enough uh, exactitude? Well, there's um, a case where this was considered um, Gillen and Quinton against the United Kingdom. Is the law uh, narrowly enough written, written narrowly enough to avoid the abuse of power? We don't want unfettered power. Okay, that, that would be an abuse of power. 
uh, as you saw, find the case, say, Khan um, and the United Kingdom 2002 about um, surveillance. You know, CCTV cameras, control orders, spying on him even inside his house. Um, we have to see whether a legitimate aim was being pursued here. Um, upholding national security, that was a legitimate aim. The safety of the public, that's one. Um, the uh, economic health of the country, that's another one. Um, preventing malfeasance and felonies, misdemeanors, this is also a public aim. Um, uh, public health, that's a permissible aim, something like coronavirus, restricting our rights to do this or that, stopping you, searching you, maybe taking your temperature. Or, or morals, well, what's immoral? Homosexuality would be considered immoral. I mean, not just things that are illegal, like paedophilia is illegal as well as immoral, but maybe cru well, and cruelty of animals is illegal. Um, difficult to see what, what's m immoral that we, that we can do that's not also illegal. Um, so the protection of rights or the freedoms of others. Okay, can't think of any specific examples. So note that Articles 8 and Article 10 cra clash, because Article 8 is about, about um, privacy and Article 10 is about the freedom of the press. So sometimes we have to see which guns are going to prevail. Judge that according to the circumstances. There's no glib answer that one always takes priority over the other. So let's look at some of the legitimate objectives that uh, could be being pursued. So preventing crime, that's an S and MARPA against the United Kingdom. Um, spying on people for that reason. And it can't be like crime like walking on the grass or something like that. Um, it's got to be uh, quite significant. Um, so protections of health and morals, Wayne Wright in the United Kingdom, that's the case. Or protection of the rights of others. This is pretty in the United Kingdom. She couldn't commit suicide. So the right to life, even if you don't really want to be alive. Evans, the United Kingdom, or indeed Campbell and MGN, that is about Article 10 coming into balance. So we have to see that these things are necessary in a democratic society. We have to ask whether the interference here um, pre uh, addresses a pressing social need. Um, uh, that was uh, this expression, pressing social need, came up in handy side in the, uh, the United Kingdom in 1976, or in Smith and Grady, and see that it's proportionate to the aim pursued. You might be pursuing a legit legitimate aim, but the um, reaction is way too much. OK, for example, let's say coronavirus. We're trying to prevent coronavirus spreading. But let's say having a year absolute lockdown would be seen to be disproportionate. Um, OK. So um, S and Marpa uh, against the United Kingdom, that's a case I'd urge you to read, or Quilla and Secretary of State of the Home De for the Home Department in 2011. So um, anyway, next time we might have a look a little bit about Article 10, uh, this freedom of expression. And um, we already want to look at the development um, of privacy law. Um, OK, so thank you so much. So please contact me, direct message me, and I do online lessons on uh, law, well, loads of other subjects, and the humanities, as well as French. And uh, check out my main channel called George from Ireland on YouTube. Just search George from Ireland. That's me. I read poetry aloud. I'm a tour guide and political analyst. I'm a translator, particularly of legal documents from French, Spanish, Italian, Romanian, uh, German and Russian. Toodaloo.